And we welcome you into Studio B here on this Tuesday, everybody. It's good to be back with you after a day away, fulfilling my civic obligation to report to jury duty once every two years. And as always, it's great to have you with us today. Up first, of course, this time, Europe has been buffeted by terrorism again. A series of bomb blasts, this time in Brussels, Belgium. One in an apparent suitcase at the check-in counter at the main airport. Another blast at a popular metro station, one frequented by international diplomats and staff. 34 dead as we come on the air, many more injured. President Obama addressing the bombings. Uh, this morning at the start of his speech in Havana, Cuba, condemning the violence and saying that the people of, US, of the U.S. stand with the people of Belgium. We'll do whatever is necessary to support our friend and ally Belgium in bringing to justice those who are responsible. And this is yet another reminder that the world must unite. We must be together, regardless of nationality or race or faith in fighting against the scourge of terrorism. We can and we will defeat those who threaten the safety and security of people all around the world. President Obama speaking there in Havana, a historic address. Joining us now here, D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lanier. This, our monthly one-on-one -on -one interview with the chief. It's good to see you again. Thank good you morning. very much for your morning. time. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, you will learn a lot more about what happened in Brussels, I am sure, during the course of this day and in the coming days. But uh, we're grateful to have you here today, and it's only been a, a matter of hours, a very mm -hmm. short period of time. Uh, what can you tell us? What have you learned? What will you be hoping to discover about whoever brought about this uh, heinous attack that caused so much loss of life overseas. So um, obviously, we, you know, we're a few hours into this now. We've been receiving information all morning, starting at about 4.50 this morning here, our time. Um, so that information is still coming in, and I know from experience that the first information you get, probably very general and may or may not be accurate. But um, basically what the facts that you're reporting is, is um, pretty confirmed. You know, solid information, multiple attacks, two attacks, one at the airport and then also in the metro, multiple injuries and a pretty good number of fatalities also. So we uh, obviously are remain at a heightened level of alert here. We're just coming off of a couple of days of a very high security event at the APAC conference. So we had a lot of extra personnel already here um, working those events. So we um, we're able to just immediately deploy to some high visibility um, spots and, and some additional resources out there. So, I, I presume at times like this, as always, you interact closely with the federal government, with Homeland Security, uh, to share information with them both in, in, in both directions, both what you're seeing mm -hmm. and hearing, and also to get a feel for, uh, from them about what uh, they might feel is useful for, for someone like yourself, uh, the chief of police in an international capital. I mean, in some ways, Brussels, uh, Belgium, and the District of Columbia are very similar because they are uh, truly international capitals. When you think now of how the EU functions, Brussels is the capital mm -hmm. of Europe. Yeah, no, actually, I've been to uh, Belgium, been to Brussels. Uh, it was our sister city. I actually went with Tony Williams years and years ago to, to Brussels, so I know the city pretty well. Um, you know, we, most of our information comes in directly um, through our partnership with the FBI. So I have um, personnel assigned there on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So, but we get additional information from other sources as well. So we're getting information from three or four sources this morning. Some of it is technical uh, for, for my technical people that are out in the field, and some of it is just trying to you know, round up the facts. But we don't wait to do our, you know, increased security. When we, we stay at a pretty high level here anyway, um, but when we, as we get facts, we kind of shift our deployments in different places. A high-level suspect was apprehended uh, in connection with the Paris attacks just a few days ago. Yeah, does, days the, ago. The, does the timing seem uh, uh, non-coincidental to you? Sure. I mean, that's obviously the first thing uh, everyone was thinking this morning. I'm sure that's uh, something that's being looked into, but, uh, you know, Coincidences do happen, but not as likely uh, in scenarios like this. Uh, at the airport, the uh, suitcase that the bomb we believe was in, and again, it's very early. We'll see what uh, new information we get in the, later today, tomorrow, etc. But this was outside security. Likewise, with the metro station, you have a softer target. Uh, what thoughts do you have about uh, the apparent targeting of, mm -hmm. of areas beyond formal and harder uh, uh, security perimeters, if you will. So two things, I mean, even if we just look back at the attacks that happened in France, um, security measures 
Um, all security measures matter. I mean, a lot of people think that you need to have you know, hardened barriers and metal and bomb detection and all those other things. Any security barrier is, is useful. In the, in the France attacks, um, the bombers attempted to get into the stadium and, you know, just physical security being present kept them from actually getting in, inside. So I think the security barriers worked, at least in, in terms of the airport, to keeping that um, detonation from getting into a more sensitive area, right? So. Um, I think people underestimate how effective security can be, and then not all security is visible. So in some of the softer target areas, there are other means of providing security where you can have not only video that has some video analytics, but you can have some other detection stuff that is just not visible but allows us to be vigilant on our side. Phone lines open as we talk this Tuesday with D.C. Police Chief Kathy Linear. This is our monthly one-on-one -on -one with her, and it's a great opportunity for you watching at home to talk directly with the chief about a concern that might, you might have in the neighborhood, or something more uh, uh, broad than that, uh, something dealing with law enforcement policy, whatever it is. I hope you'll join the conversation today. Let you know, too, that uh, the earlier you dial in, the more likely we are to get to your call. So we've gone ahead and posted the number to the bottom of the screen. It's 703-387-1020. It sounds like we're in a... It's like we're in a restaurant. <laughs> uh, 703 It smells like we're in a restaurant. <laughs> the, yeah, the, it, it, it does smell good from the previous show. 703-387-1020 is the number here. We'll go to the phones as your questions and comments come in. Do uh, take advantage of this opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lanier. Have you been in contact with Metro? Do you plan to be in contact with Metro as part of coordinating government's response to uh, the most recent reminder, the most recent example of what a planned terror attack, the sort of carnage, loss of life and tragedy that a planned terror attack can bring. Yes, and then we, you know, we have more than just Metro here in, in Washington. We've got Amtrak and you know, other trans transportation uh, assets here. So those coordinations were going on very early this morning. We do have kind of in places, uh, playbooks, for lack of better terms, in place mm -hmm. for all the agencies to um, react quickly when something happens. So that happens automatically, and then there's communication beyond that. So, um, you know, that's been going on since about 5 o'clock this morning. Transit is such a tough thing because uh, people, uh, in order to choose transit, if you will, over driving or, or something else, it's all about quick. I want to get into the station quick. Mm -hmm. I want my fare card to take my money in a split second, and I hope the train comes right away. When, when you all think about safety and uh, security and uh, stopping someone who might have an, an evil intent uh, and, and some device uh, to help them harm other people, uh, you need time. So this is like the classic example, isn't it, of how in a free society with uh, so many people moving about and trying to do something in just the, the, the shortest amount of time possible that they can, that they can make it happen sure. for them. This is, this is as, t as steep, I would think, a security challenge as anyone faces. Well, I think that people understand that there's some loss of convenience for security. I mean, that's just kind of a given. You know, we want our drive through fast food to be quick too, but we don't want to go through a drive through and get uncooked food or undercooked food, right? So we, there's some trade off here, and I think in the, in the, um, transit world, I think, just like with, with airports. I mean, there's security measures that have, you know, kind of impacted convenience and speed. But I think people appreciate that there are some things that are just more important. And there are a lot of different security measures, again, that you can put in place in some of these um, softer targets that is not as visible and not as impactful. Um, but is very effective. Before we go to break, and I'll, we'll be taking a break in a couple minutes, uh, on the other side of the break, we'll be talking to Andy in Northeast, so want to let folks know that we're queuing up calls for Chief Lanier with an open line or two still at 703-387-1020. Andy, please uh, hold the line. You'll be the first call. We'll take you right after the break at the beginning of segment number uh, two. Uh, curious to get your thoughts, Chief, about a different topic. We'll come back to terrorism as people want to uh, talk with you more about that. Uh, the FBI's uh, pursuit of some sort of backdoor to the popular mm -hmm. iPhone. Uh, what thoughts do you have about the balance that clearly is uh, represented here? Uh, they have a phone from the terror suspect, the terror perpetrator in California. They want to know, uh, and I think many people are rooting for them mm -hmm. to, to find out who were they interacting with and what sorts sure. of communication were they having. 
by the same token, we're all walking around with our whole lives on these devices. Mm -hmm. So it's a fraught uh, balance uh, mm -hmm. uh, issue, a uh, really difficult, thorny issue. How do you see it uh, coming from your perspective? So first of all, it's not just Apple. It's, it's all mobile devices. Uh, encryption is potentially could um, block out all this, the whole going dark issue. Um, secondly, I think it's, there's so much misinformation out there about what agencies are seeking and what they have access to or would have had access to previously. So the misinformation is, is that uh, law enforcement agencies would have visibility into all of the content of your messages that we could just you know, plug into your phone and see your contacts and who you're talking to. That's not the way it works, and, that, and that's not what the FBI is asking for. First of all, even just to obtain subscriber data uh, or information about, you know, who the phone is, belongs to and, you know, general location information on cell phone um, cell phones is, mm -hmm. is something that is, you know, put through a judicial process. It's a subpoenas, it's reviewed by an individual judicial officer and you need a, a level of, you know, approval. Uh, approval to get it done. And so you think about this in, in that way, but you also think about it for me when I think about a missing 14 year old that we're trying to track for her mom that the best way for us to try and locate that 14 year old may be to look at where that cell phone, the general proximity of the cell phone, mm -hmm. right? So that's critical. At least if it you, puts you in the neighborhood, certainly, right? Certainly. It's critical if you think a, a person may have been kidnapped. It's been critical in some of our carjacking cases. Um, so I, I think there's a very valid use for this, uh, for law enforcement. So the issue is not um, should law enforcement have access. I, in my opinion, it's more is as long as there's reasonable measures in place to protect people's privacy through a judicial process, I think, I think it's critical that we have it. Do you have a stack of, of phones uh, at headquarters where if this technology existed and the legal uh, go-ahead was given, the legal green light, you would be able to advance? Well, that's a little bit of an oversimplification. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's not a matter of just cell phones sitting around that we're dying to see what's in it. Um, we, you know, the technology that's um, really being sought here is in critical cases for us, especially at the local law enforcement le level, it is the exigent circumstances where you are trying to locate um, someone in a critical or dire circumstance um, and then everything beyond that becomes part of the regular judicial process where you have to get subpoenas and you, you know go through the whole you know criminal procedure to get that information so for us it's a little bit different um, ours is more of an exigent urgent situation to try and find something when a crime is actually going on Chief Lanier stand by for just a moment we'll take a quick break here when we come back more of our conversation with and more of your and your phone calls for DC Police Chief Kathy Lanier a break here back with more after this